Yo, 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 and welcome back to Creeps and Crimes Podcast. My voice cracked. I'm Taylor. I'm Morgan. Did you see me? I don't know. If you're on YouTube, I was literally just in a trance. I was like this. <laughs> well, it's only fitting. Uh, by the way, this is episode 101. Hi, welcome. Ooh, can you believe it? 101 back to single digits. One. <laughs> welcome back to episode one. one. Today we'll be doing Deja Vu and Jennifer Pan. We're really new at this, so please take it easy on us. And hi, mom, if you're listening to this. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we're our best friends and former college roommates. But it's only fitting that Morgan was in a trance because we just got done with our past life regression. It was insane. It was, it was the best thing ever. Ever, 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 ever. And uh, we did them with Susan, if um, who's our angelic medium. We've worked with her since 2019. She cleanses for us. She does regression. She does reading. She does Reiki cleansings. Anything that you want. Cleansings of anything, whatever. And she could do it over the phone. So if you guys want to hit Susan up, um, her information is going to be in the show description. And it's also with our past life regression video that we posted for you Patreon OG fucking pick me cult bitches. We love you bitches. Yeah, but if you're trying to hit through with Susan in, definitely text mm-hmm. her instead of emailing yes um, it's a more responsive yeah we're around time that we're way. trying to i'm working with her on her um social media contact forms and stuff like that and we're switching emails right now so there's not like there's two different emails that she's having to look over and yeah. that, who does that work well for right i mean we can't even handle one email so literally. i can only imagine <laughs> i literally do, i don't even look at my personal email anymore like if someone e- emails me on my personal one, like sorry yeah not to give away too much because you obviously have to go to patreon to Duh. watch this but um the entire time we each did three taylor went through one because one of hers was like relatively pretty short yeah um, it was a good life so she I played much. detective the entire time of like, course i did like right at the end of each life like uh, who was mowing the grass at like, eight o'clock on a thursday this has happened the last two thursdays we've recorded like they're dead to me i'm done with them weed eating actually they're weed eating uh, anyway taylor's playing detective every single time when the end of her life would come and she found out the way she dies um susan would like try to pull her away and like enter into a new life and taylor's like i'm not ready no, I Morgan got stuck in one i got stuck in one i thought i was gonna have to come in and get her out i like actually like it was very, very emotional. Like, and I traumatic. Was, like, tra- like, traumatic and dramatic. Like, I, <laughs> like if, if anyone, like, I'm your conspiracy girl, I'm your paranormal girl, but if anyone is the most skeptical out of the two of us, it's me. It's you. It's 100% me. And who's the least emotional out of both of us? It's, it's me. It's you. You guys hear Taylor cover cases and she'll, she'll sob. sob. And I'll sit here like I have no, no fucking heart, apparently. Like, I don't know. But I'm sitting there in this life and I am this man and I'm just sitting there and I'm sobbing, guys. And they're like, can't pull me out of it. No. And my eyes, she, her eyes were like fluttering around. There's like tears streaming from them. And I'm like getting really worried because I'm like, no, this is not right. Like, because when I was coming out of life, that I didn't want to be in I would just walk the fuck out yeah but Morgan was literally tooth and nail trying to stay in this traumatic life (laughs) and we were like Morgan shut the fucking door shut the door shut the fucking door I'm like I'm ready to leave they're like then leave she literally says to us I'm ready to leave and we're like okay great <laughs> like we're trying to pull you out bitch it was great though we, we had a great time it was so cool and i am also married to my sister anyway um, oh my god definitely go sorry check marley that, check that out on patreon taylor gets murdered 80 times in her life i do i mean maybe that's why i am the way i am yeah it's always so dark and like gruesome but i had like great fun lives yeah you did i did just vibey it was just vibey in each and every one of them it was just like a tragic ending in yeah. a few of them and the entire time we talked guys we were like this so quiet it's blue it's blue it's blue, it's blue. susan's like girls you you're trying to make a vlog you're gonna literally want to harm yourself she's like you should have brought like, your fucking mics like please speak up i now. wish i would have mic'd us up i literally yeah. wish i would have mic'd us up because i'm sure that there was a lot that we heard i mean that we said that we can't hear because there's many times where our mouths are moving but nothing's coming out yeah like verbally because guys if you've never been in hypnosis like it is such a i don't know it's like you're conscious but you're not and like yeah. wor- forming words is really hard like yeah and, I, and is is that common through a lot of past life regressions i should have asked susan this like to speak out or were we speaking out because like there was like you were in the room with me and we were recording it no like, it's we common were- to speak out okay yeah because or else because you're under hypnosis like like me i came out of hypnosis and i can i could barely remember like my early lives that i went through yeah but morgan came out and remembered everything mm-hmm 
But when I came out, I, it took me sitting there and reading Morgan's notes for it all to come back to me. And more and more keeps coming back to me, like details that I saw in there. Yeah. What Susan said is regular, like normal, that you, yeah. you will like see something and it'll Probably like. Probably mine was so fucking dramatic. I mean, Jesus Christ. I'm surprised I didn't black it out and not remember any of it though. Well, I think you did black out the, that last portion, like when you weren't responding to us, but you weren't coming out of the, of the. Yeah, life. I don't know what happened in there. Yeah, I don't she, think anyone she does. was like, I was standing in a black room and we were like, no, you weren't. You were sobbing and your eyes were twitching like <laughs> you weren't in the black I was room. I something and I don't know what it was. I Maybe wish I, I'll dream about it tonight or something. I was hoping that Morgan was going to like open her first door and be like on Venus. I know. And I wasn't. <laughs> I was so sad. I just wasn't there. No, you weren't. And in the way I described my door, you probably had really high expectations. I did. You were like, this is it. I was on this the edge of my This extraterrestrial. Oh I know. She's it. a hybrid kid. And then it was like mountains, snow. I was like, fuck. <laughs> You're like, you literally moved the boulder, bitch. You, you moved, you the, moved the whole boulder. You're going to walk out and like Jesus is standing on the other side. He's like, thanks for moving that for me, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she's Jesus herself. Yeah. She's resurrected. Yeah, she's resurrected. Are you Jesus? Am I Jesus? We have to ask Andrew Basiago. He knows. He does know. He, remember, he went and met Jesus. And so this is the guy I'm talking about today. He also knows. Oh, he knows Jesus. Well, no, he doesn't. Oh. Maybe he does. Maybe he does. We'll see. Man, we've had, um, actually, we released 100 today. Yeah. And, we've had um, a really good day today. We've had a really good day. You guys, you guys have, are really popping off, loving on us. We yeah. love that. And you know that we love, like, the attention. So. <laughs> we love the positive. We're attention horror. Affirmation. Uh, but today has been very. We love being pick <laughs> We love being pick me's, duh. Um, but today's been very chaotic. But iconic. Very iconic. Um, and I'm so happy that our besties aka you get to, is that what you want to be called besties i'm just it's giving just like james charles that's sisters i know but it's still giving I, well i don't feel like i associate at all with james charles in fact i feel like i do the exact opposite it's like hey sisters but like hey besties like i just feel like it's giving that i don't know mm. like maybe if we like because it does go off of our like brand very yeah. well oh and it's gosh. literally what you guys are. but we have to say i have to tell you guys this we had this dm um oh, no. i forget her name but someone that was like i have to ask what does litb mean and oh, we're yeah. like oh it's something from our sorority like you just like say it like signing off and she's mm -hmm. like even like urban dictionary doesn't know what it was like me and my best friends we love you guys and we just walk around saying litb bestie <laughs> like litb and we have no idea what what it means and so we told her what it meant and but we're not, we can't we shouldn't i don't think we're allowed to say world. it out loud but i think you can i think I don't know. I, I mean, if you if you really looked hard enough, I think you'll probably find it. Online. I mean, I don't feel like the fucking Delta Gamma nationals are going to come after us and like, what are you going to do? Yeah, tell us that we can't say. But anyway, we she was like, we told her we were like, it, we're like, it's pretty so fucking stupid. But yeah, like, we say stupid. it like with our sorority sisters, like when we talk about like Valerie. Yeah, and, like, my it's like almost and, sarcastic, but it's not because yeah. it, it's just like something that we do back and forth. But we do need to sign off like that for y'all. Yeah, I like to be. L-I-T-C. Loving, loving the creeps. Loving the creeps. Oh, we just told him what I meant. <laughs> oh, we didn't tell you what the B meant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, oh, I can only imagine what you guys think the B stands for. Uh, loving our creeps. We, we really got to make sure that whatever the acronym is, is not a, like a <laughs> vulgar word, derogatory word. Because with our lock, it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, we should probably look it up first. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, that... Uh, we're still trying to pick a name for you. I don't mind besties because Morgan's yeah. my bestie. She it makes I, sense. I mean, I don't know if I'm her bestie, but like you're supposed to say back like you're my bestie. Yeah, you're my bestie. Thanks. <sighs> that was so Fuck cringe. And that was really cringe. Like, it was I, not cringe. I'm trying to give them a fucking name. And you're I'm like, Morgan's my bestie. And then you're just looking at me <laughs> like blinking your eyes. Like, I'm not your bestie? I'm okay. still in a trance. Oh, she Give me so some slack. Susan told us not to record today, and you're making me record. <laughs> Susan told us literally to go home and go to bed. Instead, I was like, all right, come on, let's go edit. <laughs> let's edit for the last five hours. Now we need to record an episode. We, she wanted to record two episodes today. I said, no. Yeah, well, welcome to my side of this. <laughs> no two episodes, rough. that's for sure. Yeah, no, there was no way we could do two episodes. We really were shooting for the fucking stars when we yeah. planned that, weren't we? Big. Yeah, we're crazy. Anyway, we're doing something fun tomorrow too. I'm kind of excited about that. Oh my god, yeah, and that. But will I realized be for where the location of it is is at the Tennessee Valley Fair. Yeah, like that f field area and Magnolia. Yeah, it's kind of creeps. Yeah, yeah, it's 
on, on brand. brand. <laughs> it's on brand. Jinx. So um, anyways, that will be for everyone. And we'll probably post that Saturday, Sunday or Monday on our YouTube channel. Um, yeah. Should we get started? Yeah, hit them with it. If you're driving, throw that shit on cruise control. If you got a glass, pour that shit up. And let's get a creepy. Oh, crrr, Morgan. Oh, crrr. Oh, crrr. What do you have for us today? Oh, crrr. What do you have for us to do? <laughs> what do you have to do? Oh, God. Okay. No. Um, okay. I just want to preface. Is that how you say it? Preface. Preface this and say that I had no idea what we had in store for us today. Well, like I did. I knew we were doing a past life regression, but I didn't know like the like kinks of it, you know, like yeah. I didn't know like how it started or anything. So when I did my notes for this a while back, um, <laughs> I kind of did the beginning of my notes. And I'll Susan put us in a trance. Oh, so, Taylor. So everybody get comfortable. Put your legs up. Feel free that you can move. I'm Open your kidding. eyes. It's not that special, but it is funny now when I look at it and I'm like, I feel crazy saying this because I feel like Susan. All right. I'm anyway, ready. So I want you to imagine every night when you dream, you're jumping forward in time and your consciousness takes over a real life body that's living a life in that futuristic time period. So oh. think of it like every time you dream, okay. you're you're jumping into a new body that's going to happen in the future and you're living that life oh. only to wake back up every morning back in 2022. I feel bad for my dream human. Me too. That motherfucker's running from dinosaurs and shit. Yeah. <laughs> now imagine that you're stuck in a coma for an entire year and you're in this dream living an entire different life for an entire year only to wake back up into a world that's 300 years behind what just became your norm. Oh my God. That would be fucking insane. That'd be right? fucking insane. This is exactly what happened to a man named Paul Dynick. Hmm. Paul Amadeus Steinick was born in Zurich, Switzerland in 1884. Paul's mother was Austrian and from Salzburg and his father was a German speaking Swiss. He spent most of his childhood playing about in a small village in the suburb of Zurich. Since he was a kid, he had always dreamed of being a teacher, so he followed this aspiration and once old enough to attend the university, he studied to become an educator focusing on humanitarian studies with a strong emphasis on history of cultures and classical philology. During his adult life, he became a teacher of both German and French. Paul then fell in love with a woman who ultimately ended up breaking his heart for a rich man and leaving him. She quickly married this other man and this affected Paul in ways that no one would have ever expected. He fell into this deep, dark depression. And from this, he started falling asleep spontaneously, sometimes for a few minutes, but other times for days on end. Oh my God. In 1917, he was diagnosed with the mysterious disease called encephalitis lethargica, also mm. known as the sleeping sickness. Between the years 1915 and 1926, an epidemic of encephalitis lethargica spread around the world. The exact number of people that were infected by it is unknown, but it was estimated that more than 1 million people contracted this disease during the epidemic, and it directly caused more than half a million deaths. Holy shit. The disease attacked the brain, leaving some victims in like this statue-like condition, speechless and motionless. Oh my God. Some symptoms of this disease were high fever, sore throat, headache, lethargy, lethargy. L lethargy? Lethargy. Lethargic. You're lethargic. You're lethargic. That's You're the only lethargic. thing I know. <laughs> Double vision, delayed physical and mental response, sleep inversion, and catatonia. In severe cases, patients may enter a coma-like state called akinetic mutism. And patients may also experience abnormal eye movements, Parkinsonism, upper body weakness, muscular pains, tremors, neck rigidity, and behavioral changes, including psychosis. Wow. So it really fucked people up. Yeah, that's awful. The cause of encephalitis lethargica are unknown. Like, no one knows. Does this still no. exist today? There's, like, no cases of it, like, that's reported, but... That's really interesting. Yeah, so, like, how does an epidemic go about a world, no one knows anything about it, and then it just stops? I wonder if it was, like, a byproduct of another, like, plague of I'm some I'm thinking, sort. like, tuberculosis. Yeah, like, something like that. Like, maybe am, because a version of it? We'll learn that he ends up... His passing... It, tuberculosis ends up being his, like... Oh, okay. Un, like, his... His... Undoing. Unaliving? Yeah, unaliving. His death. His death. Why are we, like... <laughs> I'm, like, we're on TikTok. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, he dies from tuberculosis. So I wonder, because, and that was also really popular during that early 1900s. Yeah. So I wonder if it was like an onset of tuberculosis. Right. Like, or just like a variant of it. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So anyway, the first time Paul fell into a lethargic sleep, it lasted for 15 days. Holy shit. The second time that Paul fell into this lethargic sleep, it was in 1921 and it lasted an entire year. Oh my God. During this, he was placed into a coma and monitored in a hospital in Zurich. And when he woke up, he had found out that his mother had passed away while he was asleep. And he mm. also had found out that he contracted tuberculosis while being at the hospital. But for the most part, he was not very sick or showing any symptoms of TB. Mm. Paul took a bit of time to recover in the hospital once he woke up. Because, I mean, your body is not moving for an entire year. I mean, so, yeah, like, can you imagine, like, your fuck. muscles? Like, like, you're literally, like, laying there, like, right. crazy. And afterwards, Paul packed up and moved to Greece in the fall of 1922, hoping that the mild climate that they had to offer would help improve his condition. To make do, once in Greece, he got a job yet again as an educator teaching French and German. During this, Paul created a relationship with one of his students, appreciating the student more than any of the rest. And the student was George Papachotskis. And I'm sure I mispronounced that. It's a Greek name. I really love the Papachotskis. Yeah, it's really cute. It's really cute. Or we'll call him George P because I know I mispronounced that. Can we call him George Pop? George Pop. Yeah. Um, we would later learn that George Pop actually grew to become a relatively important person within the Greek government. Anyway, um, hmm. Paul taught in Greece for three years and was a pretty private person for the <clears throat> most part. He would go to work, he'd come back home, and he would journal. Every day, Paul was journaling. In 1924, Paul was to leave Greece and return back home, but before he left, he gave George Pop a parting gift, his journal. Oh, he entrusted George with part of his life and soul. Like, to give somebody your diary. I literally would never. Can you imagine? I would like, rather burn it. Giving someone... You document everything in your life. Like, Paul journaled his whole entire life. And can you imagine giving someone your diary as a parting gift? Like, just... Here. No. He never told him what the notes were. Like, he never said, like, this is my diary or this is my journal. Instead, mm -hmm. he kind of told him, like, use this to continue improving your German by translating this from German to Greek. <laughs> good luck. Like, yeah, good luck. And, like, and it's like chicken scratch, too. Like, it was right. very much like scribbled notes. I like, mean, my journal is like but that. iconic notes. And you'll see why they're chaotic, iconic. Chaotic, but iconic notes. He also gave him one last instruction. Not so much an instruction, but a wish. Kind of his deathbed wish. And that was to never share the information inside this diary. It is believed that Paul never made it back home and died from tuberculosis in Italy on his travels Aww. from Greece. George, on the other hand, got to work, progressing through translation after translation, page after page, having no idea initially what Paul had given him, thinking that maybe his teacher had possibly written a novel and gave it to him just to transcribe mm -hmm. until he realized that it wasn't a novel. And in fact, it was a diary from Paul's future. What the fuck? Within the 800 pages, Paul described how during his coma, his consciousness left his body and entered the body of a person from the year 3906. Oh my God. So obviously we know now since I'm talking about it and I'm telling the world <laughs> George that Pop. George did George Pop did not uphold Paul's deathbed. No. Wish. The world now knows about Paul's story. His diary was split up into different sections. The first diary focused on his past before the 1920. I say first and second diary. It's all one. Mm -hmm. And it was 800 pages, but it was like kind of like chaptered out. Um, so the first part of the diary focused on his past before the 1920s in Switzerland. He talked about his love affair mm -hmm. and how the woman he loved left him for a richer man. He talked about his mother, his daily routines, your basic journal and your diary things. But the second part of the diary did a full 360. It consisted of time travel, futuristic events, catastrophes, predictions, worlds on other planets. It was insane. Oh, my God. In his diary, he talks about how the second time he fell deep into his lethargic sleep state, he woke up in the year 3906 in the body of a man named Andreas Nordum. Okay. Paul, who was now Andreas, was laying in the hospital bed, recovering after an accident that was described as basically a collision of two flying cars. He was surrounded by technology so advanced that it was like incomprehensible to him. Wow. Even the uniforms that the doctors and nurses were wearing in this hospital were advanced. Wow. And again, remember, this was in 1921. Right. So like for him to see anything like this, like you have to think like, 
for us now in 2022 like we would be like oh okay like that's cool flying car like we cool. could, dope like you know like right like i'd be like oh i'm just streaming but like to even think of that really in 1921 is huge right like, especially like one that doesn't have like wings or some shit you know? yeah yeah it's crazy everyone around him was speaking a language that he couldn't understand and he had no idea who the fuck andreas nordham was right so when the doctors and the medics are were coming in questioning him in a language he didn't understand he was like i don't know who the fuck you are i don't know who the fuck i am what am i doing here like what the fuck yeah but as time went on in the year 3906 while paul's body laid in a coma back in 1921 his consciousness gained more and more control of andreas's body Ooh. almost like merging with andre's knowledge oh wow Wow. And soon Paul could understand the new language. He knew everything about the new body he was in. And the most amazing thing, he knew every big historical event that had happened from 1921 to 3906. Shut up. According to Paul's diary, the biggest issues in the 20th and the 21st century are world wars, lack of respect towards nature, suppression of violence, excessive consumerism destroying the planet. Sounds right. We hmm. were there. On Paul. par. Um, these are the predictions of Paul for the future of humanity, according to his diary. And I didn't read his 800-page diary, so I got this excerpt from business.com, and we'll link it down below. From the year 2000 to 2300 AD, so everything he marks after death, because right. they still did that big time back in the 1900s, I guess. Mm. We don't do that. We don't do 20... Like, right now, know. we're in 20... 20- 22 AD. Do you know that? Yeah, but like I would never write it like that. Right, but like we are in AD. It's just like that, that, this like piece of knowledge that just like sits here that we know it's AD. Like, I mean. Yeah, but like even then, like even back when we first started this podcast, we're like, wait, is it BC or AD? Were we? Yeah. No, we didn't. Yes, we did. We're like, we can't even fathom that. Wait, is it before Christ or after death? No. We did swear no okay. we didn't i'm gonna punch those bitches in the face yeah i'd punch us too um <laughs> from the year 2000 to 23 so t- i i don't even know how to read these like here i am again <laughs> doing it again <laughs> 2300 humanity was still struggling with the problems of overpopulation they had ecological destruction of the environment economic inequalities the wrong monetary system lack of appropriate nutrition for all people and local minor wars people were living in this like hastily race for atomic financial survival without time to look for their inner self in spiritual development so for from now for the next 300 years basically we have no growth we're fucked we're fucked and we continue on these this little- is like so contradictive of what andrew basiago talks about yeah 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 in the year 2204 a large colonization is completed on the planet mars oh and it consists of 20 million people but 60 years later in 2265 a very vast like natural catastrophe kills every single human being on mars so from then on mars was never tried to colonize again so note to future yeah. self don't fucking go to mars if mars ever gets colonized stay on earth do not go note to grandchildren <laughs> if you're listening to this and you're my grandkid don't you dare go to mars bitch stay on earth because you will die <laughs> you're going to die okay in the year 2309, as a result of accumulated non-solved problems, another big disaster comes to Earth and causes a huge, like, global war. So, actually, war. just go on to Mars. Um, a great part of the civilization, as we know, stops to exist. In 2396, the great change leads to the final establishment of a global parliament on Earth of the Global Union of Nations or States. But this global parliament, it's elected through voting by nations, but it's not from politicians or businessmen. Instead, it's consisted of scientists and technologists and humanitarian figures. Hmm. Which, like, can we just do that now? Honestly, let's do that. Like, instead of having businessmen and politicians in in charge, like, why don't we have? Why aren't we having the people that actually, like, Like, know know stuff? The money as we know it does not exist anymore. Like, there is no, like, monetary program. The planetary resources are redistributed and are now enough for every person. Overpopulation, climate, nutrition, and ecological problems, they are all solved by 2396. Life is easy. People work less and less during their life as time goes on. And the years start counting again with the year number one. What happens? Um, I, I don't know. Is, does someone come back? But fortunately, the global government was a form of totalitarianism. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Great. And so these national governments then oppose this one, like the new world order, Mm -hmm. basically 
directly for the next couple centuries. People are still with national consciousness and have not developed the planetary consciousness until about 200 years later. Although there are not economic inequalities as we know them, there are still inequalities over control of the level of technology and properties. People here are still spiritually weak and sluggish and they called this the peculiar dark age era. Hmm. And this lasts until about the year 3400. Holy shit. But in 3382, a remarkable phenomenon happens to humanity. People one after the other acquire suddenly a new spiritual ability that could be called like hypervision or hyperintuition. And it's this like direct access to the great spiritual light. Oh. Or like a direct knowledge with extremely powerful clarity, like creative powers. Like your third eye's and open. Your third eye's open mm-hmm. and they they categorize it like the scientists they were because that's who's leading your right. earth now, like as a mutation of the human brain. A mutation? Yeah. A good mutation. A good mutation. A good mutation. Um, From 3400 to 400 AD, a new golden age comes in humanity after almost 1,000 years of that peculiar dark age. Now in the global government, there's no more scientists and, like, technologists at all. Is everybody just... There's just the universal creators, personalities that combine simultaneously the qualities and abilities of a philosopher, an artist, a scientist, a mystic. Everything in the society is free. We're talking clothes, housing, food, transportation. There is no private property and the only inequalities are of honor and reputation. So it's like if the counterculture free society movement crossed with ancient beliefs of like gods. It's kind of like if every era you pull bits and pieces of and Mm -hmm. put it together together and smash it together it's, like that's what you would create it's like we're this. doing trial and error trial error era. Era. yeah at this point no one counts the success of their lives anymore like with technological and material standards of living but mainly they count the success as emotional mental and spiritual development and self-improvement i don't know that I would do good there I I definitely would fail. <laughs> People work only for 2 years in their entire lives. What do they do? Just live life. I'm just living Live life. Yes, <laughs> you're living life. Between the equivalent of 17 and 19 years. So like usually when you're 17 and 19, that's when you work. I mean, okay. Yeah. The population of Earth is less than a billion people and there is abundance of products for a decent living. The laws in the society are radically reduced to very few only as the negative or criminal intentions of individuals in the society are almost absent. So there's no criminals. During this time, there are only three kinds of laws. Three laws for okay. the entire Earth. Okay. The first law relates to a two-year term of work, meaning you can't work over two years. The second laws relate to a travel traffic and distribution of goods, meaning like you can only travel so much and everyone gets the same amount of food, basically, is what I'm saying. Like distribution of goods. Like we're not going to overuse the goods of the planet. Like we're not going to. But you can't travel? Well, pollution. Okay. Well, I don't want to live there. Yeah. If if I can't go to fucking Italy, I don't want to go. And the third law relate. I mean, it doesn't say that. It just says laws relating to travel, like traffic traveling. Like can't just be like hopping and bopping about. Like I wouldn't mind to like walk. Like you know, is it like travel talking about like I can't drive my car to Target. Like I would yeah, just have to like walk. I'm sure it's just like limit your fucking travel. But like it's fine. not like necessarily a car either, you know. Like, but like I don't also think- if you're like not working, what the fuck else are we supposed yeah. to do? And the third law relates to a stable population size, and it's the control of births. So you can't have twelve kids. You can't have five kids. You I can probably how they only it. have. You can probably only have two kids. That's teetering on like a control of women's bodies. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know. I mean, it would be like I don't want to go. This to- is this is. F- 3,000 years from now so I mean I know it's not gonna affect us 1,000 years from now or whatever it's only a thousand well wait 2022 to 3,400 I mean that that's like our our 100th grand great 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 times yeah. 100 crazy so I get Paul's wish but if I was George I'd also kind of share the crap out of this like I'd yeah. be so fascinated back in 1920 that I'd want the world to know of all of this what would you do if you if someone handed you this diary a I teacher would. who you looked up to you it he was your greatest role model and said, please do not share this with anybody. But I wanted to give you this as a parting gift. Like he knew he was dying, obviously. Yeah. He knew he was sick. His TB was back. Like he knew he was going he was yeah. to die. And he gave it to his favorite student because he didn't. He only had his mother left in life. And right. he lost her when he was in his coma. Right. So he gave his favorite student his book. Like what, what would you do? Personally, immediately read it, told my friends about it. But I don't think I would have like publicly done that to him until like a well bit after his death because that can make you look like a crazy person, especially back then. Like, I get if he was still alive. Like, if he was still alive, that'd be fucked up. But since he's yeah. dead and he's got, like, no family, you know? 
Yeah. So once George had it translated, the diary was only shared with a very close circle involving okay, some pretty high up government and church members. Oh. The diary was passed around with this super close knit, like philosophical and Masonic circle after it got through the government and the church. Stop. Where then these circles decided that the information should not be evade, made available to the masses since it was so controversial and many people were probably not going to handle it well. But of course, George was like, yeah, fuck your philosophy. I'm telling the world. Yeah. So in 1972, this was during the dictatorship time in Greece, George publishes a book and it's called The Pages of a Diary of Dynak. George Pop immediately became under attack. He lost mm. his job. He was accused as a heretic by the church and copies of the book were quickly like disappeared like pulled off the shelves i hope they bought them no <laughs> only a few remained. as um, long as you still get that cash George. so there was another publishing attempt made seven years later in 1979 when greece transitioned to a democracy mm -hmm. however all of the books disappeared again off the shelves within a month mm. the only person attempting to help george was a man named Rad radamanthus a a high-ranking ex-member of many greek secret societies and he tried to publish the book on a small scale exactly as it was written by paul and it flopped and it flopped because it was 800 pages long it was written like like he entries. published it as a journal entry like yeah. as the translations given by George so it flopped like no yeah. one can sit down and read that no now Paul's diary has been properly prepared edited giving an easy to read format along with like really beautiful illustrations that someone has I think we put have to together it. yeah it is called the Chronicles from the Future the amazing story of Paul Amidas Dynick and you can purchase it on Amazon for $19 or $9 on Kindle but before I end my segment, I'm going to read an excerpt from the book on the decline of the 20th and the 21st century. And this is directly from Paul's diary. Paul says, the 21st century had to come in order for people to suddenly realize that they were hovering above a frightening gap in the global public sphere and that their institutions were completely obsolete. So gradually, the once dominant states began to bestow, deliberately or not, part of their previously almighty powers, especially in the fields of foreign policy, international relations and arms to a central federal political organization. They kept their historical memories, traditions and customs, language, legends and their domestic institutions. But they had now realized that in a future war, there would be no winners and losers. They would either stick together or altogether they'd lose. They began to see who the true enemy was, the lack of strong and effective global institutions with the preventive mission to control all forms of conflict. The smaller nations were rather comfortable with their old social formations and had their own internal problems to worry about. So they were the last ones to adopt the new forms of organization. The great powers, however, which had come to the fore in the 21st century were struggling to understand one another. There was constant winning and complaints about the ways and criteria of the distribution of universal income. No one ever believed that their share was fair. These reactions of the 21st century were meant to become the omen of the future, the separatist movements, which erupted repeatedly and were incited by the same political nuclei of the initial reactions. It was a materialistic century, an era of zero sensitivity, zero concern for human values, and zero noble feelings. It was an era of unilateral technological progress without the necessary moral maturity of man. Everybody was only interested in themselves. Love, straightforwardness, mercy, and forgiveness were all swept aside. What prevailed was the thirst for power and domination and the smothering of every reaction or emotion that arose by any means possible. Paul Dynick. Holy fuck. Bro. He wrote that in 1920. About Nailed. us? Oh, wait, 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 who, me? <laughs> oh, me? Am I the drama? Who, the United States? Are we the drama? <laughs> Isn't that Whoa. crazy? Stop. That was fucking whack. Yeah, that was I'm deep. tripping dicks right that now. That was deep. Past life regression and then this bullshit? I know. And so what's really cool on their website, if you go to it, the way that they have written out the the Chronicles of the Future book, especially on their website, but they have like his first part of the diary, the second part of the diary, how I kind of explained to you how Paul wrote it. And then they also have like a timeline, like chronological events. Like they put it in order for oh. you. They have their illustrations. They have like important, important figures. They have the reason why oh. um, the, this author had to edit and publish the book the way that he did instead really? of like giving out Paul's diary the way that it flopped so many times before. And yeah. like the church fight and the dictatorship fight fight and like i don't know why i can't say that word today but also on the website though he has free excerpts and from the book and wow. he has eight of them 
so that you can like get a little like preview well i didn't even need to look at it i bought it while you were reading that you did buy yeah, it i bought it on amazon Fuck i'll be yeah. here in three days it'll be here in three days <laughs> yeah. yeah so anyway it was fucking that's fucking crazy that's fucking crazy for someone to you know like you're in a coma i've always wondered what what goes through your head when you're when in coma? You're in a coma for Paul, like he didn't even when he woke back up, he was like, "What the fuck am I doing right. back in 1920?" Like I right. just lived a life, yeah. In the year 3000, like just went to the year 3000. So Not much has changed, but I lived underwater. And your great 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 granddaughter, yeah, she's doing fine. She's doing fine. Yeah, Joe Bro said it best. Yeah. So like I don't know, it's fucking crazy. And for him to write what his predictions are for the life that we're living right now, like that's spot on. Like, and, <laughs> and I know like that is like you can argue and say like oh well, well you can right now we can foreshadow what's gonna happen in twenty years from now. Like, but like also I can't like I couldn't write that good of detail of like what's going on and like be so fucking spot on. No, I, I don't even think I've been. I, honest to God, I am like not the type of person that can talk about beyond my lifetime. Yeah. Like, I, I could talk about things that I want to do within my lifetime. I have lifetime. a hard time seeing into my future. Me too. I, I literally can't. I, I, I always thought I was going to die. I yeah. always thought I was going to die. Yes, me too. When I was younger, I was like, I don't live past my 20s. No, when we were living together, you told me that all the fucking time. And you're like, stop saying I that. I was literally like, I was like, I don't live past my 20s. So like, what am I doing? Like, you do. Can confirm. <laughs> literally can confirm. You do. Anyway, that's all I have. You are up, friend. Um, So I didn't know this. You guys know that for the most part, Morgan and I don't like explain tell each other what we're doing before um and uh, very rarely do we do unless we're calling each other and like bitch i gotta tell you this because i just can't keep this to myself for another yeah. two days um but i didn't know that we were both going to be international girlies today oh love that yeah. well i was kind of backing off of andrew Bassiago today yeah too. well i'm in scotland it's no ireland but it'll do yeah still over this over the pond over the pond before i get started i'm going to give you a trigger warning for sar brutality abuse and targeting of women so we're in glasgow that's how we figured out it is glasgow i want to say glasgow but i literally know it's glasgow glasgow on the morning of friday february 23rd 1968 a 67 year old man was on his way to work passing through carmichael place which is kind of like a district or a neighborhood and as he's walking he notices a body lying in the doorway of a lockup garage at first he believed that it was a drunk person who had just passed out while trying to get inside but when he bent down to help the person he realized that they were dead he ran back home calling police telling them that he had found the body of a dead man this is awful but it's just a part of the case but i want to let you guys know that like i'm not agreeing or condoning this it's just literally like a part of the case but when police got the call they did not send anyone they didn't even call out for it because they thought it was a homeless person who had just died of the elements or an addict who had OD'd. It is still a human life. I'm pretty sure police officers, please, please fucking go. Go like, and respond It's to literally the call. someone's best friend, sister, Baby, brother. Baby, child. Yeah, like regardless don't fucking whether do they're that. an addict or just a homeless person. It doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't matter. Because of this, it happened to be that two traffic cops were making their rounds when they came across the body an hour later. At 8 a.m., the first detectives arrived at the scene and realized that this is not what they had thought at all. It was not a homeless person. It was not an addict. It wasn't even a man. It was a woman. She was fully nude other than one shoe, lying on her back with her head turned to the right. She had bruising and marks around her neck from her own stocking being used to strangle her. And it was later determined that she had been brutally beaten, raped, and strangled. No clothing, no accessories, no handbag anywhere near her. The only thing left was a sanitary pad. Like used? Yeah. Police canvassed the area searching for leads or just anything that would tell them who this woman was. One report said that they had seen a woman matching Jane Doe's description getting into a nearby car. Another neighbor reported hearing a woman scream, leave me alone in the middle of the night. Jane Doe was beaten so badly that the only description police could give was that she had dark brunette hair, brown eyes, and her approximate weight and height. She suffered severe blunt force trauma to her head and chest, making her almost unrecognizable. Despite how hard nurses and doctors tried at Victoria Infirmary, there was nothing that was going to make the bruising and swelling go down enough to be able to get an identity. It wasn't until an ambulance driver was driving her and he recognized her 
it was a nurse from Victoria Infirmary, the hospital she was just at. But if Whoa. this woman wasn't this nurse, like if this was a woman, wouldn't her coworkers and friends had recognized her? Right. Since they literally worked with her and they were working on her. I would recognize a coworker like that. Right. Police sent the woman's description to all of the newspapers, media outlets, trying their best to get a solid lead. Reading the woman's descriptions in the evening paper later that day was a man named John Wilson. As the hours passed, he found himself wondering what time his 25-year-old daughter would be home from work, thinking that she had gone out to eat with some of her friends after. But as the hours passed, John became more and more worried. The next morning, John realized that his daughter had not returned home. He immediately rushed to the police station with a photo of his daughter. After looking at the photo, a detective regrettably asked John to view the body for identification. It was his daughter. Patricia. The location that her body was found was literally yards away from her parents' home. Oh my gosh. John thought that she had just stayed with a friend after a night out and that she would be home after her shift at the Victoria Infirmary. The night before, Thursday, February 22nd, Patricia had come home after her shift got ready and went dancing at the Majestic Ballroom, according to her parent. So that is where detectives started. A witness came forward saying that he had danced with Patricia at Majestic that evening, but the Majestic closed at 10.30 p.m. But according to the postmortem examination performed by Dr. Gilbert Forbes, the stage of rigor mortis that Patricia's body was in indicated that she had died of strangulation just after midnight. So where was she during this entire time? It took weeks to put a timeline of Patricia's last hours together, but the investigation ended up leading detectives to the Barrowland Ballroom. So let's talk about this time, the state of Scotland, Glasgow at this point. So according to Sam Arnold's reporting on the crime beast in the 60s, Glasgow was dark. The buildings that remained after the war were severely damaged and the city was mostly collapsed. Most people did not have running water. Drains were open in the streets, literally just filled with human waste and litter. People went to work and mostly immediately returned home, repeating this cycle day in and day out. But what makes everything better in times like this? human interaction, and dancing. Because of this, it is no surprise that dance halls and clubs were packed every single night, especially the Barrowland Ballroom. Located in East End of Glasgow, despite the area's rough reputation, Barrowland was the place to be. At Barrowland, Thursday and Saturdays were over 25 nights, or as they called it, grab a granny night? Oh my gosh. And I'm offended. I am too. I'm a year away from being a granny. <laughs> you, you're At a year club. <laughs> you're literally months away from being a granny. Um, no. Grab a granny night. You'll see us there immediately. Appalled. No. Thursdays always had a really different vibe. Not just because it was the over 25 night slash grab a granny night. But from 8 p.m. to midnight, the vibe changed. It was simply an opportunity to just dance your fucking ass off, get lit, flirt, maybe get laid, like whatever you wanted to do. But it was well known that most of Thursday night attendees were married people slipping their rings off before walking in and looking to switch it up sometimes with their partner, but for the most part without them. Okay. So it was like a cheating hunting ground, basically. Okay, perfect. Great. With the grannies. Right, with the grannies. Uh, because of this, being at Barrowland was a tad bit taboo, especially on a Thursday night. A what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas Yeah, the name, mentality. even the name is giving just like rave, like tripping it on is. acid, like crazy. It, it's really weird. That is probably why 25-year-old Patricia Docker did not tell her parents that she was going to Barrowland. She said that she was going to Majestic, which was like a little bit more tamed. And that was on the night of Thursday, February 22nd, 1968. Patricia had recently moved back in with her parents along with her four-year-old son after separating with her husband. At the time, he was in England working for the Royal Air Force, so it was just her and her son. As I stated, she was a nurse and this daily cycle was almost claustrophobic for her. So that evening, Patricia went out to dance, drink and meet new people, be free. She put on makeup, spent extra time doing her dark gorgeous hair slipped on a knit yellow dress babe so cute i would babe that is so cute 
and Total babe. a gray duffel coat that had blue fur before Fuck adding yes, her favorite granny. jewelry. Like <laughs> she literally was like, I'm going out tonight. Witnesses from Barrow Land that night reported seeing Patricia dance with many different men, but it was thought that she had left or last danced with a man that was redheaded. After dredging a nearby river, police discovered Patricia's bracelet, part of her watch, and her purse with everything inside. Despite the discoveries and the leads, Patricia's case was coming to a halt, and all that detectives could figure was that her death was a crime of opportunity. The one-year anniversary of Patricia's death came and went, and there were still no new leads. On Saturday, August 16th, 1969, so this is a full year after, well over a year actually, 32-year-old Jemima McDonald dropped her three kids off at her sister Margaret's house just across the street from her own in Bridgeton. She hugged Margaret, her daughter Elizabeth, and her two sons, Alan and Andrew, trying to tilt her head so that her curlers wouldn't shift inside of her silk scarf, which she planned on shaking out just before walking into her regular dancing spot. The Barrow Land. <sighs> Fluffing up her gorgeous dark hair in the ladies' powder room, Mima, as her friends called her, was so fucking excited for this night out. By noon on Sunday, August 17th, Margaret was surprised that Mima hadn't returned to get up her kids yet. She usually would pick up her kids early in the morning, and if she didn't collect them that evening before, like, she would typically come home, grab them, walk across the street with them, KO, you know? Yeah. But she didn't show up the next morning. It was already well past noon on Sunday. Margaret just figured that her sister had maybe spent the night with a man or maybe she was like violently hungover and needed a sec or maybe she just wanted to clean up the house before getting the kids and have some alone time. Either way, Margaret did not mind letting her sister have that time to herself. It was just out of character. Well, that evening, Margaret watched as her and Mima's kids played outside when she overheard the kids telling creepy stories. They were talking about this body that they had seen in a no. nearby abandoned apartment apartment building. This building was well known in the area because kids would play in it like all day long. But after dark, the house or building had a very different reputation. It was a common place for prostitutes to hang around and bring their clients and homeless people to spend the night. Margaret didn't think much of this tale, that is until the next morning, Monday, August 18th, when Margaret had still not seen or heard from her sister Mima. So early that morning, a frantic Margaret threw on her shoes and rushed just a few yards down the street to the abandoned building. When she opened the door to this almost condemned building, she saw a mannequin. It was lying on the bed. She got closer and she realized it was not a mannequin. It was a body. It was her sister, Jemima, lying face down. She was mostly clothed, with her shoes and stockings lying beside her, Margaret rushed home and immediately called police for help. Detectives arrived to find 32-year-old mother of two, Jemima McDonald, with her black dress and white blouse still on her partially, but ripped off. Her underwear looked like it had been torn off of her, and her coat was lying nearby. But her purse and all that would have been inside of it were missing. Jemima had been raped, brutally beaten, especially in her face and chest. And finally, she was strangled with her own stockings. An autopsy revealed that she had likely died 30 hours before her discovery, an hour or two after midnight in the early morning hours of Sunday, August 17th. Inside of her underwear that was still lying nearby was a sanitary pad. She was on her period. Oh my God. Police went door to door looking for any leads. When reports came in about a woman screaming in the early morning hours of Sunday, police then traced Jemima's last steps that evening, learning that she had gone to Betty's bar across the street from Barrowland for a few drinks to get her warmed up before going dancing. Witnesses at Betty's reported observing Jemima chatting and drinking with a red-headed man. I knew it. After Betty's, Jemima went over to Barrowland. There, witnesses watched as she danced with the same red-headed man from Betty's. Tall, maybe 6'2", slim, possibly in his mid-20s, early 30s, dressed nicely in a blue hand-stitched suit with a white button up underneath. He stood out because most people didn't dress like that, especially in this area. He was not a regular, and he definitely was not a local. Either way, others came forward claiming to witness Jemima leave with this redheaded man. The two turned right onto Bain Street, 
and then left onto London Street before walking towards the Bridgeton Cross, heading towards Jemima's flat just across the street from her sister's, a few yards away from the building where she was found. It was less than a mile walk from Barrowland to her apartment, maybe 20 minutes if you were walking at a good pace. Police even used undercover officers to recreate that night, dressed similar in the same like dark hair as Jemima's, like everything. But there was nothing. They created a composite sketch of the redheaded man using witness statements and memory with a art professor at a local university. Nothing. They pled for leads from the public, even going to Barrowland on Saturday and Thursday nights, asking for witnesses to come forward. Nothing. Officers went undercover every single night at this dance club. Never once did they see a redheaded, slim, sharply dressed younger man. It was barely a week since Jemima's murder and it was already at a standstill. It wasn't until the two week anniversary of Jemima's death that detectives made the connection between hers and Patricia's murder. So let's discuss the similarities. They were both last seen at the Barrowland Ballroom at an over 25 night. They were both last seen dancing or interacting with a redheaded man. They both had dark hair. Both were mothers. They were close in age. They were both raped, beaten, and then strangled with their own stockings. Both of their handbags and inside belongings were missing. Both were killed near, like within yards of their own homes. And they were both on their periods. The only differences in their cases was literally one fact, and it was that Patricia's body was found completely nude, whereas Jemima's clothes were still on her, but she was like, they were partially ripped off of her. Police continued their undercover surveillance of the Barrow Land until mid to late October of that year, so like just a few months after, after not being able to produce any viable leads, but also because like the owner of the bar slash dance hall was like pissed. They're like, you're hurting my business. I'd have been like, you the murders are hurting your business sir you or ma'am you literally have a serial killer here right so you want to keep going are you involved in this to hurt your business right in the morning of friday october 31st so halloween but i don't know if they celebrate halloween in scotland i don't know Uh um it so like literally as a week after they finished their surveillance, a man was walking his dog in the Scoutston district of Glasgow, and he was behind an apartment building on Earl Street, just letting his dog sniff around in what is similar to like a courtyard or a garden. And his dog leads him near this drain pipe. And beside the pipe, the man discovered the remains of a woman. He called police. The woman had dark hair. She was lying face down. Her clothes were torn, but partially on, like Jemima's. She had been brutally beaten, mainly focusing on her chest and face, and it was clear that she had been raped and lastly strangled to death with her own stockings, which this time had a semen stain on them. Her purse was missing, but this time its contents had been scattered across the lawn, and the woman had a bite mark on her wrist or her leg, the sources differ, And lastly, just like Jemima and Patricia, there was a sanitary pad. But unlike the previous victims, this pad had been removed from the woman's underwear and placed under her armpit. A man woke up in his flat hearing police chatterings, radios, seeing that a flood of police vans were around his building and in his garden. He walked out to see what the commotion was about, wondering when his wife would be returning home. <gasps> no. Figuring that she had just stayed with her sister after they, after they went out dancing that night before. His name was George Puddock. George went to an officer asking what was going on. An officer told George about the woman's body that had been discovered. George turned frantic, asking what the woman was wearing. Was it his wife? 29-year-old Helen Puddock. George frantically told officers exactly what she was wearing that night, what she looked like, what her makeup looked like, giving a full description. And it was Helen. The woman found, the third victim, was Helen Puddock. 
The night before, on Thursday, October 30th, Helen got dressed and was excited to go dancing with her sister, Jeannie Langford. Helen and her husband, George, who was a corporal with the British Army, had just returned home to Glasgow after being stationed in Germany for the last few years. They were still searching for a place to buy, so for the moment, they were just staying with Helen's mother at her flat on Earl Street, and they had the couple's two kids with them, a five-year-old and an infant. Jeannie, who is Helen's sister, was so happy for her to return that she planned a night out dancing with their closest girly friends. George wasn't super happy that Helen was going on a Thursday evening to Barrow Land, but it was something that Helen loved doing with her sister and her friends. So he kept it to himself and just hyped up his wife as she got ready to go out on her girls' night. Helen did her hair and her makeup before slipping on a black sleeveless dress and a fur coat. Jeannie arrived just after dinner to pick up Helen, kissing her mother and her two nephews goodbye as she playfully giggled out the door with her sister walking in her arm. George passed Jeannie a ten it's a ten dollar bill, but whatever their version is, shilling note shilling note. Um, shilling. Yeah. Ten dollar shilling. Or as they shillings. were walking out the door for a taxi home later, which was like a luxury. And he kissed his wife goodbye. Aww. Jeannie and Helen danced and drank at Barrow Land, and the two began chatting with two men, both named John. One John worked as a slater, and the other one did not give much personal information, but he was well spoken, dressed, and he had red hair. Fucking knew it. John the Slater danced with Jeannie and John the Redhead danced with Helen. At 12 a.m. on now October 31st, the two Johns and the sisters grabbed their coat and walked out of the bar with the two Johns. I wish bars still had coat checks. I know. You know what I would get? I would pay $100 to not have to have my coat on me in a bar. Yeah. So John the Slater had who had danced with Jeannie the entire night, he went on his own. Like he went to the bus stop. But John the Redhead offered to split a cab with Jeannie and Helen as he said they were both on his way home. The cab took Jeannie to her Knightswood home, which is like another district, and dropped her off first before confirming Helen's address. Both Helen and John were then dropped off on Earl Street at 1 a.m. Approximately 30 minutes later, John the Redhead was seen exiting a bus near River Clyde Ferry. But this time, his suit was not clean pressed. It was disheveled. His face was badly scratched, and he already had bruising on him. Jeannie told police um, that until the cab ride, Redheaded John gave no information about himself. But in the cab, he said that he was living with a relative in Castle Milk. He was not married. He worked for a lab, but used to either be a police officer or in the military. He was slightly an asshole and judgy, but in like a charming way. He played golf often, but he wasn't as good as his cousin who maybe he lived with. And his last name was either Templeton, Simpleton, or Emerson. But Jeannie did not remember which it was because she was like half ass listening. Yeah. He had red hair, blue gray eyes. He was over six foot. He was in his mid 20s to early 30s. He had um, his two front teeth were kind of slightly overlapped and his nails were neatly trimmed and his hands were very smooth. Oh, also, he was missing one tooth on his right upper jaw. He had a wide leather watch band, a metal badge or pin that he wore on his shirt that he continually touched and rubbed. He smoked embassy cigarettes and spoke with a local accent, but was not of the local culture, like almost military. And then he started talking about religion in like a weird turn of conversation. He said that he has a sister and that they were raised by extremely strict religious parents. And both him and his sister were considered to be disappointments in their family to their parents because they were not as religious. As he spoke, he made many biblical scripture references and quotes, specifically talking a lot about Moses and the Old Testament, explaining that his parents were teetotalers, which are individuals who practice total abstinence from alcohol. Using Jeannie's detailed and vivid account and description of this man, who is now been coined Bible John by the media, Police, with the help of an artist, Lennox Patterson, who had created the first sketch, created a full color composite sketch of Bible John. They released this composite seven weeks after Helen's murder to all of the UK, all of the military bases, and even warships. As an investigation, I'm sorry, as investigators believe that their suspect 
could be serving or a veteran of the military. So let's talk similar similarities again and timeline. Uh, first, let's do timeline because I forgot to write that out and I just know it by heart. Um, so we see that there was a large gap between Patricia and Jemima. But between Jemima and Helen, it's literally two months. Yeah. Which quick. is a classic sign of escalation. Yeah. Then we see that in the first one um, with Patricia, she was left completely new. Like it was almost a statement, like artistic. Whereas with Helen and Jemima, it was a lot more like disheveled and fast and seemed like it was a frenzy, like in a rush. Whereas with Patricia, it seemed like his time was taken. And maybe Patricia had been in a car with him. Because there's no way that he could have picked up all of her belongings except for one shoe in a sanitary pad and left. Right. But similarities of the crimes. Um, they were all last seen at the Barrowland Ballroom on an over 25 night. Seen dancing and interacting with a redheaded man. All three had dark, short hair. All were mothers. All were close in age. We have 26, 29, and 32. They had been raped, beaten, um, strangled with their own stockings. Their handbags were gone except for Helen and Jemima's belongings inside. Uh, except, I'm sorry. Except for Helen. But Jemima's belongings were not inside. Um, only Helen's were left behind. They were killed near their homes and they were all on their periods. The only difference is that Patricia was found fully nude when discovered. Well, what do we know about this suspect? Bible John. Very short, almost like a buzz cut military haircut. And the shortness of his hair was actually considered out of fashion, even for the military. They allowed it a little longer. His incisors were overlapping. I'm sorry, his two front teeth were overlapping. He was missing an incisor tooth um, on his upper right jaw, according to Jeannie. He came from strict religious family, known the Bible verses, like by heart, could quote them, like very, very well known with the Bible. Um, was either a veteran or a former police officer. Has one sister, a cousin that likes to golf, either lives in Castle Milk with a relative, maybe that same cousin, works in a lab, is well-spoken with a local accent, but does not carry the local culture, seems well-educated and well-spoken, dressed sharp, thin, 6'2", red hair, wears a pen, uses barrel land as a hunting ground. Detectives went to over 450 hairdressers in Glasgow. Literally every single hairdresser in the area. And all of the dentist offices in the area with the composite sketch of Bible John. No one recognized him. There were a hundred detectives assigned to this case working full time. 50,000 witness statements were given and 5,000 potential suspects were questioned within the first year. So let's talk about the suspects. Number one, we have John White. Detective Chief Inspector Les Brown combed through the arrest records for the year of 1969 when he found John White. John White was later denounced as a suspect originally because he did not have the notably overlapping front teeth. The man that, um, I'm sorry, John White was arrested for arguing with a young woman and getting physical with her at the Barrowland ballroom directly before his arrest. He looked similar to the composite sketch, but again, the only thing that was missing were his teeth didn't match. However, it was later discovered that he had given a fake name and a fake address. Well, after his release, when speaking with another officer, Brown found that John White had been taken to the hospital after his arrest outside the Barrowland Ballroom um, following one of the murders after he had gotten into this altercation with a woman. And she had actually scratched him so badly on his cheek that he needed stitches. So the officer that arrested him took him to the hospital. But when the handcuffs were taken off of him, he fucking jumped out a window and ran away. Holy shit. Les Brown believed until 2005 that John White was their Bible John, even writing a book about his beliefs about John White. Well, when this book went out, John White, still an alias, came forward and gave his DNA testing. He was not a match to Bible John. Holy shit. I was going to say him acting out in the club, like that's just not like him. That's not the MO. That's not that. Yeah. Like right. our guy would be very cool, calm, collected. Right. Like very chill nature. Yeah. 
Number two is a man in the Netherlands. In 1983, an unidentified man called a police department claiming that he was friends with Bible John. They were both born and raised in Cran Hill District of Glasgow and often attended Barrowland Ballroom in the 60s. And his friend was always attracted to dark haired, thin women that had a curvy build like they had given birth. Oh, they were all mothers. The alleged suspect was traced to the Netherlands and was married to a Dutch woman with dark hair. However, nothing more was ever reported on this. Don't tell me this isn't unsolved. Number three, the Hannah Martin rapist. After the Bible John killings, several women came forward claiming to be essayed after an evening at the Barrowland Ballroom. One of these women was named Hannah Martin. She was assaulted and raped by who she claims to be bible john her attack took place in april of 1969 and she had left barrel land with a tall man that had red hair and she later gave birth to this man's child whoa we do not know if the child's dna has ever been tested against the dna they have from helen's murder oh my god Mm -hmm. number four john arvin mckinnon mckinnis mick mcguy um In 1996, the body of John Arvin M. was exhumed. He served as a Scots guard and had committed suicide at the age of 41 in 1980. John was the cousin of the original Bible John suspect, which I don't know who the hell that was. They never said anywhere. I couldn't find it. And a DNA sample was taken from his body after it was exhumed to compare to the semen samples recovered um, at the Bible John scenes. However, it came back inconclusive and he was cleared as a suspect in July of that year. Number five, who is the number one suspect? Peter Tobin. Do you know that name? No. He's a serial killer. Oh. Peter Tobin, it's a Scottish serial killer. Okay. Yeah. Like, no need to feel bad about it. It's like not I'm a Zodiac. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't. Yeah, he's not like a Zodiac. I know him. Yeah. Okay, tell me it's about him. It's probably best that you don't know like a serial killer by name. That's pretty, probably psycho of me, right? Yeah. Um. So Peter Tobin was a Scottish serial killer and sex offender who was sent to prison for the double rape committed in 1993 by him. He only served 10 years and was released in 2004. Three years after his release, he was sentenced to life in prison for the 2006 rape and murder of Angelica Cluck in Glasgow. When his home was searched during the investigation, they found the remains of two teenagers who had gone missing in 1991. Over the years, several profilers, criminologists, and investigators have speculated that Peter Tobin is Bible John. In 1968, uh, Tobin had met his wife at the Barrowland Ballroom which he was known to frequent in the 60s. Peter was in his mid-20s during the time of the murders. Though Peter did not have red hair, he was a great match for the Bible John composite. His MO in his later crimes, though they were more violent, showing escalation, just like Bible John, it was very natural and calculated. And again, just like Bible John, his victims were all on their periods. Oh my god. Which Tobin later stated enraged him, which is why he killed them so brutally. He was very strongly religious in the Roman Catholic faith, and he had a well-known pseudonym, John Semple. In 2010, a woman... Templeton. Mm-hmm. Simple um, 10. Emerson. S- simples. She gave like 15. Emerson, yeah, Simple sound the same. But they also, and that's like how it starts at Imbol, like that mm-hmm. thing. In 2010, a woman told detectives that uh, she had been threatened by Tobin at the ba- Barrowland ballroom after one of the Bible John murders, but he had introduced himself as Peter that evening. When showed a photo of Peter during the 60s and 70s, confirmed that this was the man that like threatened her. She said, Yes, that's Tobin, but I'm 100% positive that that is Bible John. Peter Tobin was later ruled out as the Bible John suspect and through DNA testing. However, at this point, the DNA is extremely sparse and highly contaminated. Therefore, detectives still consider him a person of interest. Um, But Professor David Wilson believes that Bible John was a police officer. Wow. And they also were able to tie another attack 
to another murder, I'm sorry, to Bible John that happened in early 1969 before Jemima. I absolutely think it was Peter Tobin. I think that there's like serial killers out there that based off location of where they are, they're like MOs change, like of like how they commit their crimes. Well, you know what I think? So, you know, after Helen's murder, we know that Bible John got off of that bus and was going to a ferry. I wonder if he like lived in a different place and just came here and like it's kind of like an uh, Israel Keys killer Mm -hmm. like just goes to a place for a certain amount of time kills people there and then switches yeah like a normal life normal guy just travels for his murders that is fucking that's crazy insane hope you guys enjoyed it and fuck a serial killer who is targeting women because they're on their period but like how do you even like start with that I, I, i'm sure it's not a target i'm sure it's like a oh i'm gonna target them. but then again you have to think like how is it that all three are on their period right so unless he's like monitoring their bathroom use he's stalking them after they go to the bathroom and he's checking for the like um disposal me- box for a sanitary pad like you know what i mean yeah. like he could be doing that and verifying that they're on their period and then gets enraged by them and has to kill them right I don't know. Or maybe it's like he's like, do you want to go hook up? And they're like, I can't. I'm on my period. Yeah. And then he's like, "Okay, well, I'll give you a ride home or let me take you home. Yeah. And then he kills him. But that also makes me so sad for the the woman that was married. Oh, they were. Oh, well, yeah. uh, Helen. 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 Yeah. She had just gotten home, literally had been overseas with her husband who was in the military for years, had two kids that she had to raise on her own while living in a different country with no one that she knew. I guess it was a different time period, but what was she doing? She was, that's what, that's what they were talking about in this one article I was reading. They were like, she was just so fucking happy to be with her sister again. Her sister was her best friend. Yeah. And then gets murdered. I wouldn't know what to do. I mean, I, uh, I did read that Jeannie died at the age of 71 in 2010 and that she like dedicated her life to wow. yeah. helping find Bible John. I also hate that that's his name. Me too. I don't like it. I don't like it. Like we need to give him like a gross name. Maybe like a misogynistic asshole John that hates women on their period. Misogynistic asshole Bible John. No, take Bible out of Bible. it. Bible. Misogynistic asshole John. Yeah. Like use it like that. Yeah. I hate that they haven't caught it. I they know. will one day. They will one day, and I can't especially, wait. Especially, especially with the ch- a child being brought in the mix. I know that threw me for a curveball. Me too. When I was, I was like, oh my fuck. You know who? You know how I bet would could solve this in like a fucking year. CC Moore. Oh, the girl that did Chrissy Mirac and everybody yeah. else's shit. Like she, that I, I would literally kill to meet CC Moore. Yeah, I, I'm such a big fan. I would love to do that, but you have a better shot, my little science queen. I'll just be like, give me some DNA. We'll run some stuff. I'll find the case. You just run it for me. <laughs> Good deal. Perfect. What if we turn creeps and crimes into that? Into a detection laboratory. Creeps are crimes. So we're going to put them behind bars. All the creeps. Creeps are crimes. Laboratory diagnostics. Creeps are crimes are us. <laughs> Shop that. We'll get back to it. Laboratory diagnostic. Yeah. CC laboratory. CNC lab. CNC diagnostic. CNC lab genealogy no it has to be like d c c and c d okay we're done what does dna stand for is it a like a is a foreign word and yeah no really no it's just scientific word let me look it up uh, yeah i've got to know i know what rna is like the ribonuclei hold on and then we have like <laughs> rsvp respond i see play d deoxy ribo okay yeah so rna is ribonucleic acid dna is deoxy ribonucleic acid wow and that, why would I know what RNA is, but not DNA? I'm like, it's ribonucleic. I, let me say. <laughs> let me let me double check. Yeah, that's really deoxyribonucleic acid. So DNA is just acid. Well, it's a chemical, an organic chemical. It's not like acid, like you're burning your skin off. <laughs> well, obviously not because it creates skin, but like it's like a. So if you inject someone else's DNA into like, if I were to inject my DNA, like get DNA out of me, like just a DNA thing and inject it into your DNA, would it kill you? I don't think my body would take that well. Like, do you think that's like altering someone's genes? <laughs> just don't know. I don't think we have the. T- I don't think we've tried that. Well, I'm sure like we, we have. have tried that. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. It's because beyond. I feel like that would be like pretty detrimental like to mutation. your DNA. Yeah, you know, it would cause cancer at least. Yeah, the very least. Okay, You'd probably. Sorry for that. Destroy the structure of my whole entire DNA strands. You'd so what happens if your DNA just like 
deteriorates inside of you, but everything else is still working okay. I have no idea. What, I, I can you survive without DNA? Like, there's not a human being. It's that not like have your DNA. heart or anything. Like, it's like what? But it like it was a foundation of the building of it. Yeah. So like, I wonder if there's any person that, like doesn't have DNA. No, everyone has DNA. But like, what if there was one person? <laughs> I mean, I know this is like being really like <laughs> this is we're far. done here. We're done. But like, <laughs> I'm just saying. I wonder if there's a person that like doesn't have DNA. Like there, ha- you know, like there has to be. You know how we just find new blood types all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like they'll find like random ass blood types, and yeah. they're like, we didn't even. Or there's like there's like two people in the world that have a certain blood type. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. There has to be like something similar to that with DNA and RNA. Like probably like different like types of like DNA strands that they're finding, like different like like cross crossings of like s- mutations or whatever you chromosome, whatever you would call it. I don't know. Big big questions for it little would more, girls. More so hurt your child than you if you did that to me. It would hurt my baby. Your baby? Yeah, because if you fucked up my DNA, then my DNA would be fucked up to carry through. But I don't think you. I think you would die. <clears throat> I don't think so. Okay, well, we love you guys. (laughs) All right, love you. Bye.